Good afternoon, everyone. Perfect. Thank you. My name is Barbara Muraka. Um, I am a social professor of environmental philosophy here at the University of Oregon, and it is my great pleasure and honor to guide us through the event today. Before getting officially started, let, let me just remind you that there is food there. Um, you can grab a lunchbox. There is all options, vegetarian uh, and vegan, and there are drinks to the back, so feel free to grab something to eat and to drink during the event. Before getting started, I would like to read the territorial acknowledgement. The University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilehi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their communities at University of Oregon and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. We express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon. This includes the Burn Paiute tribe, the Confederate tribes of the Coast, Lower Umka and Sayusla Indians, the Confederated tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon, the Confederated tribes of Siletz Indians of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquille Indian Tribe, the Cow Creek Band of Umka Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. We also express our respect for all other displaced indigenous peoples who call Oregon home. Activism can bring us to a better world. Art to new ways of imagining it and ceremony to an understanding of sacred space, relationality. Good afternoon to all of you and welcome. As I said, my name is Barbara Muraka. I am a social professor here at University of Oregon. I am originally from Italy, from the Alps, from the mountains there and have been living here for about six years, so a lot of this is new to me. It is an honor and a pleasure for us, and I'm speaking on behalf of the large organizing team and everyone participating in this event. It is an honor and a pleasure for us to open and welcome you all at the Arts Ceremony and Activism Panel today, an event of the Snake River to Salish Sea Spirit of the Water Totem Pole Journey here at University of Oregon in Eugene. Bringing these events to Eugene has been an incredible adventure that involved so many people who made this possible and worked hard for years for this project. We're profoundly, profoundly grateful to our partners and guests, the Lamination House of Tears Carvers, the intertribal nonprofit organization Cecila, the nonprofit organization and collective natural history museum, the Totem Bridge Film Project, the Sierra Club, and many others. We would also like to thank our partners at University of Oregon for all the work they have put in this adventure. In particular, the Student Sustainability Center and Taylor McCall, the Center for Environmental Futures and Masha Weisinger and Stephanie Le Manager, the Philosophy Department, the Environmental Studies Program, the Native American Student Union, and the Many Nation Longhouse and Katie Staten. We would like to thank all the sponsors here at University of Oregon. You can see on the slide how many responded to our request for funding. The whole university is behind this effort like a big embrace to welcome our guests here today. We also thank the Meyer Foundation for sponsoring the whole Totem Pole journey, also besides Eugene. 
We also want to thank our team of graduate and undergraduate student workers and all of the volunteers. Huge thanks to Ryan. Jesse and Sarah. Thank you. And a big thank goes to Brianna Meyer, who unfortunately is not here today, um, but she's following to the live stream. Um, many of you know her. She has worked for years to make this possible when she was still a, a PhD student here at University of Oregon in the Environmental Studies program. Uh, she's now a postdoc at MIT and is behind so much of the things that are going on today, and she should be here in my place right now to welcome you all. I'd like to make a special thank to Dr. Kurt Russo, co-executive director of Cecila. For the countless hours he has put into organizing this week's event and supporting our growing partnership. Finally, we want to acknowledge and thank two beings who have brought us all together. First, Tokitai. Tokitai is an orca whale living in captivity in Miami who was kidnapped from the Solish Sea in 1970. She's calling out for help to go home, and the totem pole journey and Cecilia have taken up her call. The totem pole we will experience today is carved in her honor. Second, we want to recognize Tali Kwa, a mother orca who lives in the Salish Sea today. In 2018, Tali Kwa gave birth to an orca baby who died not live, who did not live, sorry. She carried her dead baby above the water for 17 days, swimming for hundreds of miles, calling out to the world to help the imperial Salish Sea. The baby orca you will see on the totem pole outside was carved by Jewel in her honor. Taliqua and Tokitai's calls and the totem pole journey and Cecilia's work to help us all learn to hear them led to this collaboration. We are taking up Taliqua and Tokitai's calls to help and we hope you will join us in this effort. Please join us in a big applause to thank everyone and welcome our guests from the Snake River to Solid Sea Spirit of the Water Sodom Pole Journey here in Eugene at University of Oregon. <laughs> Activism can bring us to a better world. Art to new ways of imagining it and ceremony to an understanding of sacred space relationality. Today's speakers will share their experience in bringing together art, ceremony, and activism in some of the most significant environmental and social justice campaigns over the past decade within and beyond the Pacific Northwest. I will give, you, give a quick introduction of all the speakers now, and they will then take turns uh, offering their gifts to you today. And I will ask them to stand up while I'm introducing them. Jay Julius is a fisherman, former chairman and councilman at Lamination. Jay was a leader in the fight to protect Cherry Point. He has organized and executed tribal, local, regional, and national campaigns. Jay is the founder and president of Cecilia. Thank you. <laughs> Joe de Gaudi, former chairman of the Yakama Nation, Jude is now with Red.org, an educational resource center. He brings expertise on the doctrine of discovery, among other things, to the table. He's a CELA board member. <laughs> Gian Lawrence. Giancarlo Gian Lawrence, a self-taught fly fisherman who grew up in the infamous hilltop neighborhood of Tacoma, nearly died of stab wounds, and then ventured out into the forest with nothing more to lose. Gian learned the art of angling and became, now, uh, and became known as the black stonefly for his skills at tracking steelhead and salmon in the rivers of the West. Gian has been invited as a guest and witness of the Spirit of the Waters totem pole journey. Robin Everett. 
is Sierra Club Senior Organizing Manager based out of Seattle, Washington. She has worked alongside the Lamy Nation since 2014 in many projects, most notably the successful campaign to stop, stop a coal export facility at Cherry Point. She has helped on several totem pole journeys over the years. <laughs> Becca Economopoulos. Becca is the director of the Natural History Museum, an ongoing art intervention that leverages the power of history, monuments, museums, and movements to support environmental and climate justice. The museum is a project of non not an alternative, a collective that works at the intersection of art, activism, and critical theory. Thank you. And last but not least, Jewel James. He's a Lamy tribal member, member. He's a master carver of the House of Tears Carver, the totem pole you will see outside right after this event. You are moving out to the totem pole. It's his work and the work of his brother, um, Doug James. Um, he put 44 years of work in the area of, of treaty rights and environmental protection and has been leading the totem pole journeys for over 20 years. Thank you. I'm now introducing and uh, handing over to the director of the Center for Environmental Futures and professor of environmental history at the University of Oregon, Dr. Masha Weisinger. She would give us a couple of words of welcome and then we will continue with the speakers. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for making it. At the end of the event, guided by Jewel and all of us, will go out to the totem pole journey and gather around the totem pole. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Marsha Weisiger. I am an associate professor of history and environmental studies. I'm also an environmental historian. I study in part indigenous environmental history, particularly the history of the Diné or uh, of the Navajo Nation. Um, I welcome you here as the co-director of the Center for Environmental Futures, which is a major co-sponsor of this event uh, with generous funding from the Mellon Foundation. The Center for Environmental Futures is a publicly engaged center for the environmental humanities, the humanistic social sciences, um, the humanistic arts, and education. And we also administer the Pacific Northwest Just Futures Institute for uh, Racial and Climate Justice. Uh, and so together, the Center for Environmental Futures and the Just Futures Institute are incredibly honored to have the opportunity to support the totem pole journey uh, because at its heart, uh, Cecily is working not only to sustain salmon and orcas and the health of the oceans, but also environmental justice for the, for the Lummi Nation and for all the tribal nations of the Pacific Northwest who seek to sustain the lives of our more than human relatives. So again, a big welcome from the Center for Environmental Futures and the Pacific Northwest Just Futures Institute. Thank you for coming. Good morning. My name is Jay Julius. My traditional names are Slayokton and Watatlam. I am a tribal member from the Lummi Nation 
I'm a lifelong fisherman, and I come from hundreds and hundreds of generations of farmers of the river, farmers of the sea, and uh, there's no other place or people I would have rather been born into than where I am today. I'm, uh, I'm a grandson of Dora and Felix Solomon, Haynes and Vila Julius. I am the founder and president of an organization called Cecila, which in our language means our grandmother. <clears throat> and I think as we walk through this day, this journey, maybe for the rest of our life as we think about arts, ceremony, activism, and the schedule today, uh, you might get a little different perspective on the position of activism, the challenges of the English language, uh, in words like activism, for us it's a way of life. For us it's um, uh, a way of life worth fighting for, uh, worth preserving inherent birthrights for not just us selfish humans, but um, things that were here long before us, who have had a connection to place, uh, sacrificed their lives to make sure the future generations are born like salmon. Um, Tokatai brought us together and her mother watched her get kidnapped and flown to Miami and she's been held hostage for a long time. What does that mean as a mother? And if we think about our human way of thinking, and if our mothers witnessed something like this or what has taken place in the natural world, um, how would they feel? And then as we look at the bigger picture of all of our giver of life, Earth, our mother, our grandmother, the ultimate giver of life, um, it really shifts our thinking from our natural human thought process which has become a selfish way of thinking. And, and I'm going to uh, make sure I let you know ahead of time if I offend anybody, that is not my intention. Um, our intention is to just share some perspectives, philosophies, and ways of life that our um, uh, forefathers, grandparents, and great-grandparents um, did before us. And they didn't take us to school and teach us how to do this uh, in an institution. It was done on the water. It was done at the dinner table. It was done around the fire. It was done in our upbringing and stress that this is the most important education we'll ever get in our lives because this is what's passed down from generation to generation. And ultimately, before I get into this, um, <clears throat> it's that one thing. It's that connection to. It's that oneness, as I shared yesterday. We might leave here today asking ourselves when our relationship with what we call nature now was severed. Where in our lifetime or in our past was it severed? And when did we develop a mentality that we are above, we are supreme, we are dominant, we can do things at the expense of? And I think if we go deep into that thought process, um, and I don't think we have to get really technical about it, but once we reach that aha moment, I think we'll find that there's a, there is a relatedness. There is a web. There's a connection. There's a oneness. And, uh, you know, the divorce that might have taken place in the past with that relationship, um, I think we can mend that. And I think that is our hope. I think that is all of our hope is uh, how do we get to a future and how do we adjust the trajectory we're on. And for us, if I may take you on a journey back in time just for a little bit, uh, for us, this trajectory over the last 162 years, I believe it is, since my family, the sovereigns of this land and the sovereigns of this territory, entered into an agreement with an immigrant the United States. And we entered into this marriage, and it's called a treaty, and under Article 6 of the Constitution, it is the supreme law of the land. And within that treaty, things were guaranteed. They weren't privileges reserved for the natives. They were 
inherent rights reserved. And within those, we look at the challenges that all of us face, whether it's rivers turned to lakes, whether it's salmon inability to go up and reproduce. Um, all of these things are protected under the Constitution, Article 6. But why are we where we are today? And again, my family and your family shook hands and entered into an agreement and uh, I think we don't need to point fingers back at anybody else, but I think moving forward, if we understand or um, think about what honoring a contract means, what does honoring a real estate agreement mean, what does honoring a treaty mean, um, uh, it's both of ours, and uh, it is that treaty which... Uh, in the end, protects salmon, protects rivers, because, um, again, for us, when we look at activism, when we look at ceremony, when we look at arts, um, it is still our way of life. <coughs> and going back to pre-treaty, um, our languages were our languages. We were very uh, bilingual. We spoke many different traditional local languages. Uh, with other tribes, and uh, uh, the trees, as I shared yesterday, it would take eight of us, maybe ten of us, all here to lock our hands together, and, and then we can wrap our hands around a tree. And that's what once was. When we look at this world that we call home now, today, here, uh, the transformation took place in the last 16 decades. It's not what it once was. This garden was a place of perfection, and when newcomers arrived, they said there was absolutely nothing. But for thousands of years, this place sustained us, and we had everything. Everything. And uh, our canoes are what we call arts today. Our canoes were made out of uh, uh, trees that had fallen, our dugout canoes, our reef net canoes, where I come from, were reef netters. And our ceremonies sometimes mirrored what the Quotalmachtin did. And Quotalmachtin, you may know as killer whale, blackfish, orca, but its real name is Quotalmachtin. And the southern residents have been one with us since time immemorial. They teach us ceremony. They teach us love. They teach us community. They teach us what it is to be a community and provide for each other. They teach us that everybody has a purpose. And really, when you look at the way that Quithalmich didn't live, uh, it's something that we duplicated. We learned how to fish from them. We learned how to uh, be respectful for one another and fish side by side. When outsiders come into the southern resident's home where I live, there's a ceremony that takes place. And the outsiders come in, and the local southern residents, they meet and they communicate, and they're face-to-face -face in a line. And communication goes on, and I believe it's an invitation process, a welcoming process, and they sit, and it's really cool. It's awesome, the ceremonies that they perform. And then once that ceremony is done, there's frolicking and welcome and um, rejoice. And But the struggle today for them is starvation, pollution, and uh, how do we create empathy for something that is in the natural world, an empathy that is so deep? And I think that's what you hear Native nations, tribal nations, especially from here, trying to get across in the English language. I have to go into my grandmother again really quick. My great-grandmother died in 1980. I was born in 1975. She was born in 1888. My great-grandfather was born in 1892. He, too, died around the same time, about six months before her. So, I'm 46 today in 2022. They were raised by individuals at a completely different time when the world here was near perfection. 
when everything was alive, when everything flourished, community was community. Families were rich. The water was pure. The air was pure. There was respect for everything. But that little time I got to spend with her and him, but I'm going to just really um, stress my grandmother, my great-grandmother, because it's because of her I'm here. It's without our mothers, and, and you know that relates to Mother Earth as well, um, because they give us life. But the little philosophies, the struggles that they faced and what they witnessed and what they were seeing happen before their eyes, this drastic change. And um, it, it helps us put into perspective that Jewel is part of a different world. Jewel struggles and Jode struggles and his family and my family we're trying to find that balance in two worlds. We're raised by individuals who are raised by pre-contact individuals. And while we're in universities and we study Indian history and U.S. history, 160, 170, 180 years seems like a long, long, long time ago. But it's not. I am a individual who was raised by individuals late 1800s, and there's probably some here as well. But for us, this, this garden in the philosophies of newcomers uh, has created a challenge and we want nothing more to understand one another, respect one another, respect one another's worldviews because in order for the future generations to have hope, it starts with that. It has to be all of us. It can't be just some. Because we've collapsed time frames in a way and in, and in such. We witness it in Europe. We can read the books on Europe. The collapse of salmon. The decay of rivers. The decay of the cities. The great development. And then the flee to North America. And uh, you know, we're a place-based people. We're salmon people. And uh, as these salmon near extinction, as the rivers turn into lakes, as they begin to dry up, I may still be here in flesh, but if the salmon disappear, it's hard for me to put into English words. But my existence, my who I am, and who my people are, is is gone. Our spirits and souls crushed. It. And, and uh, uh, we, we, you know, this can't just be about me as a salmon people. But I think when we talk about honor, when we talk about treaties, when we talk about a marriage that we're in together, we should uh, at least take time to hear and feel and understand each other's worldviews, and uh, not fail to reflect and believe that the truth is true of what happened in history, and uh, what has happened in history and in the past and on the East Coast and Southern California and the Sacramento River is now moving to the Columbia. It's moving to my river. It's moving to the Fraser. And if we keep going on this trajectory, it doesn't take a university to figure out what the inevitable is. But I think you're the hope. I think we're the hope. I'm not an elected official. I'm a fisherman. I'm a father. And uh, it's through the organization, it's through your efforts and our efforts and the teachings of each of our ancestors that... I, I think the hope comes from, and that, that, that is all of our hope. And, you know, I, I, I want to stress this again, that, that we're on this journey, and a lot of it has happened for, for Lummi and for my family, Kuthalmachtin, the Orca, the southern residents, are on the verge of extinction. 
And that's not okay. It's not okay. Um, in English words, we say they're relatives under the sea, and I know that's hard to begin to fathom. But they are a part of us. They're a part of me. And uh, I think that... Um, uh, some of us and you, I, I have to believe each and every one of you were prayed for back in time at some point. You were dreamt of. You were dreamt to be here. And what is that purpose? What is that reason? I'm not sure. But if we're dreamt by others, if we're dreamt by the salmon, if we're prayed for by the orca, the Quithalmachtin, our ancestors, to be here at this moment in time, to do something that might be little, but creates a ripple effect that changes the trajectory that all of us are on, helps us get back to a oneness, a natural world where we're not separate from, we don't have a supremacy or dominant mindset over everything else, and we're the most important thing on this planet. Uh, that is our hope. And I think it's through the past one's dreams, prayers, that uh, we are all here today. And I think it's time for all of us to answer the call, whether it's small or big. Uh, it's an honor to be here, to be a part of this discussion, conversation. I want to thank Jewel and Doug for their thankless work that they've done for you for me, for the salmon, for treaty rights, for just being a voice for five decades. And uh, Jewel is a family member of mine, Doug. They're her first cousins to my father. And uh, it's just an honor to be able to share a few words and share the stage with the other great speakers who are here today to share a little bit of wisdom uh, around art ceremony. And... Uh, Thank you for your willingness to possibly answer whatever your call is that you were prayed or dreamt to answer. It's an honor, a privilege. Hopefully see you out there to lay your hands on the totem pole that will travel a great distance to stand with others who are struggling to preserve a river, preserve salmon in a way of life. Heishka, thank you. My name is Chai Kwach. My English name is Jode Gowdy, and I appreciate the introduction that came forth earlier. Um, appreciate my brother Jay there for his words, and as well as the speakers that will follow. <coughs> and um, you know, I said, well, we want you to speak about ceremony and activism. And, um, and I'll tell you that my interpretation is we are engaged in a form of ceremony right now. Each of you are contributing to that through the thoughts that are coming out of your mind. When did this particular ceremony start? My estimation of that would be whenever Joel, Kurt, and Jay, and Doug got together and said, okay, it's time for another journey. And when that thought originated, the ceremony started. Since that thought originated, and in my interpretation, that ceremony started, there's been a number of physical, mental, and spiritual acts of discipline that have supported that thought process. And that, and uh, I guess you can say in some people's definitions, would be a form of ceremony. Uh, someone else might call it activism. But I don't know if activism is quite the right word. Um, as was expressed, you know, the English language is a challenge because of the manner of the etymology of where words come from, where the origins of those words come from, and how they can be utilized in various forms depending on the context in which you are, you know, bringing them out. So 
I think that uh, as far as today is concerned, you know, you see the relatives outside, you see the totem, uh, you see the the other relative that's out there, the other smaller totem, the salmon. <clears throat> Those are part of the uh, the physical and mental and spiritual acts of discipline associated with the entirety of the ceremony that's engaged in what we are calling the totem journey. It's with the intent. And as was kind of uh, expressed in some of the talks yesterday, why? Well, I think individually and collectively we come to at least a, a realization of the observation of the practical reality in which we are observing individually and collectively and saying that we disagree with something. We disagree with the way that is manifested. We disagree with the outcomes of, of what it means for us today at a practical level. And we wish to initiate you know, some thought process that manifests action to change that. I guess that's what you would call activism. Um, and so um, as we move forward in time and when we take our individual and our collective assessments of what this practical reality is for us and whether or not we agree or disagree with the way that it's manifested, how it affects us individually, how it affects those that we love, how it affects our communities, our peoples, our nations, our society in general, then the question becomes, okay, I'm looking at this picture and I don't quite agree with the way that it's all panning out. All right. And then the question is, what am I going to do about it? All right, what am I going to do about it? I mean, that's the question, right? Well, I mean, um, all of us, you know, you know, we're as native people, and I think all of you, as a, I think it was Jay expressed yesterday, all of you are native people from somewhere. You know, throughout your individual family's history, you come from a native people. You know, whether or not you're of any race or background, there is a native origin to your line. And so within those uh, origin stories, and as you go back to our lineages, you have that warrior spirit, right? And uh, in a sense, some would say, well, we can't be the warriors that our ancestors were. And if we, you know, all came together here today and said, we disagree so much with this picture that's manifesting and what it means as far as consequence for us, but more importantly for the future, for our children, the grandchildren, those yet unborn, that we have to do something extremely, um, do some extreme acts to change it. We well, can go so far in the thought process. Okay, well, how about we go pick up arms and we say we just can't, can't do this no more. We are physically going to fight the entities, our individuals, our collective bodies that are manifesting this version of reality that we disagree with. Well, I think that the powers that be, as far as those that might be identified as the adversaries or the dominators who are manifesting and reinforcing this picture, uh, would probably wipe out uh, myself and anybody who chose to follow me if I was going to be the one to lead that charge with others um, in short order. Okay, so that's that's off the list. I'm not interested in getting slaughtered, and I'm not interested in saying, come follow me so you can get slaughtered with me. Okay, um, so what are the options with regard to saying, what am I going to do about it specific to this picture I disagree with? Well, you have other practical means by which you can engage in forms of dispute resolution, okay? Uh, we may pick a fight. We may get into a legal battle. We may proactively go um, lobby and legis uh, for new legislative law to change the boundaries by which when people or entities or uh, bodies disagree with something, how they can advocate for a better future. Um, all that's fine and dandy. Uh, there's also the expression of art, of art, you know, because where does it all originate from? Your position of how you've made your determination of a reality that you disagree with and somebody who, who perhaps is on the other side and they may be part of reinfor reinforcing this reality that you disagree with and they may be conscious of that or they may not be conscious of that. There are people who reinforce uh, positions in life that have negative outcomes with something that I disagree with substantially. There are people who are on the other side that I would say, you are reinforcing a, a, a position in life or an identity in life that reinforces something that, that uh, has negative consequences, the outcomes of that. 
But you know what? There's people who are like that that are really beautiful people as individuals. That, that's, a, that's a real, you know, mind thing to, to think about. You know, in my previous I served in the Yakima Tribal Council for a few years. I served as the chair of that council for about six years. And I've engaged in those practical forms of dispute resolution uh, quite a bit with regard to invoking strategies for change. And um, many times I've interacted with individuals who I said, that's a, good, that's a good man or that's a good woman. Unfortunately, they come from the spirit of domination as far as their practical um, identity, uh, their, their position in their job or their capacity in which they engage in. And so, like, where does it all originate? And to me, it, um, that, that's a funny question, but for all practical purposes, I'll say it originates in thought, okay? And so when you get into the picture that we looked at, maybe individually or collectively from a practical perspective, where does all the negativity and the seeds that have planted this picture that perhaps we disagree with, whether it's water, salmon, the orca, whether it's other natural resources or other entities or beings that we uh, wish to have a more respectful relationship, uh, where does the detriment come from from a practical sense? And, you know, it's uh, two days ago, May 4th, uh, 1493, Pope Alexander VI issued a papal decree in Terra. That papal decree was one of a many of them, a series of them, which essentially gave the monarchies of Spain, England, uh, the Dutch, uh, various ones during that time period, what I call, like, what I like to call unholy marching orders. All right, unholy marching orders issued to these monarchies, and I'll paraphrase it. In a sense, if the representation of these monarchies came upon any lands, all right, and they deemed those lands to be uninhibit, uninhabited or inhabited by what they deemed to be infidels or heathens, uh, that they had a holy right to exert dominion all right, on all lands and waters and said heathens and sab, uh, infidels that were occupying that area. And it was that and these other papables that the monarchies of Spain utilized in ceremony when Cristobal Colon arrived at what we understand to be Honduras today. Later on in time, John Cabot utilized the same uh, holy, uh, unholy marching orders to establish the first colony on the eastern uh, coast of the United States, what we know to be the United States today. So the foundation of discovery is based, in my estimation, on what I would venture to say a false religious pretense. The Roman Catholic Church gave these monarchies a holy right to exert dominion. And this is what we understand to be discovery today. And the picture and how it's taught and how it's indoctrinated people in time uh, throughout has, has, I think, society as a whole quite confused. But the other part of history is that the United States utilized and adopted the principles of the doctrine of Christian discovery and the foundation or the origin of its legislative, of its judicial and its executive branch and then the governance of the United States. In the judicial branch, it reinforced a uh, formal adoption saying the United States inherited uh, the, the principles of the doctrine of Christian discovery and the foundation of federal Indian law. It's also the origin of property law. It's a case called Johnson Lessee versus McIntosh, which, which happened in 1823. And so this was the first, uh, I guess you can say, recognized federal Indian, Indian law case uh, for the origin of federal Indian law. And if you understand <clears throat> dispute resolution in the form of, ju of the judicial today, you have everything under the sun. You have water, you have land, you have commerce, you have jurisdiction, you have everything that you can think of that's arisen as far as disputes are concerned. But let's say, for instance, uh, water and um, natural resources and salmon and, uh, and these things. The lineage of case law that can be traced back that is uh, forming the practical reality as we understand it through judicial case law and supplemental legislation has an origin to Johnson v. McIntosh. It's like a family tree, all right? And there's a branch that leads up to water and to salmon. And you go to the current case law that's governing us, and that current case law is going to have citations, judicial citations in there. And you can create a map 
you go to those citations and you read those cases and you look at those citations and you create a trail. And that trail, more often than not, almost always, is going to lead back to Johnson Lessee versus McIntosh. So in the principle of what is gover uh, governing the discussion of water today, or the governing the discussion of salmon, or governing the discussion of dams, or these kind of things, in principle, okay, you still have this essence and this spirit of the doctrine of Christian discovery that's ruling the day. And this is the reality that we live in today as far as a practical reality of dispute resolution. Now, throughout time, uh, there's been an ability to change the rules as they go. Uh, they did that through the judicial branch of the United States as well, specifically through the cases of U.S. v. CAGMA, uh, Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock. What it did is it said that, like uh, Jay had expressed, we have some treaties pursuant to Article 6 and Clause 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Treaties are the highest law of the land, and all states are thereby bound to, right? That's what the Constitution says. So it should be simple. All the articles of our treaty should be upheld, and we should win all the time. But we lose most of the time. And the reason we lose most of the time is because in those two cases, Kagama and, and Lone Wolf, the judicial branch of the United States asserted to the legislative branch a extra-constitutional plenary authority, which means they get to make new laws and rules as they go forward. That's your way that they change the rules, and this is the way that they've overcome the articles of the treaties. And so if you get to change the rules as you go into the future, that's why, uh, because between the Stevens Treaties up to Lummi, all the way to Yakima, all the way to Nez Perce, okay, if the articles of our treaties were truly upheld, upheld, we would probably be having a pretty substantially different discussion about the way that the relationship with water, the relationship with salmon, the relationship with orcas, and all everything in between. If we were truly going to get into the understanding of what we can utilize as far as acts of activism, our participation and ceremony, to sustain what? To sustain a better future. To at least give our children, our grandchildren, those yet unborn, the opportunity to be able to experience what we have. Experience these things that uh, for Native people it's a little bit simpler because we're associated with our lands and we haven't been torn apart from those ceremonies and those ways of life uh, too far. This is what sustains us and gives us a reality by which we can live in a more balanced uh, manner. My individual existence with that of the collective existence and our reality. Once again, we're looking at this picture that we disagree with and we're asking ourselves what we're going to do about it. I think that, yes, you can be active. Yes, you can conduct ceremony. There are real things in the practical world today that we need to identify as far as the kind of things that are there. The doctrine of Christian discovery is ruling the day as far as uh, the protection of many of our resources. And I think that the kind of awareness associated with that needs to come very, very strongly in all manners. And I would encourage anyone and everyone to go look these things up for yourself. Understand them. Because you may be fighting for water, and you may be invoking, and you may be holding that sign at the protest, and you may be standing up, and you may even get arrested. You may do all these things. But I'm going to tell you, what did those acts do as far as the outcome with regard to the system that's reinforcing a spirit of domination upon the lands, the waters, and the peoples? So that's what we need to look at, is where the origin of the will is coming for, for the spirit of domination to continue to manifest. So I'll stop there, and uh, thank you very much for your time. And um, uh, thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Giancarlo Lawrence, and uh, I'm from Tacoma, Washington. Um, I'm a fly angler, I'm a father, I'm a conservationist, and I'm an activist. Never did I think I'd be standing here, ever. Uh, never thought I'd be speaking after my brothers um, on this journey. This is huge for me. Um, I wasn't always a fly angler. 
I wasn't always involved in the outdoors. Uh, I lived a life of trouble, and I've been in a lot of trouble. Um, I was born in the Hilltop neighborhood, um, low income, and I moved into the suburbs at a young age. So I kind of had been being pulled back and forth, you know, by different different groups and different experiences. And uh, I went down a path trying to find myself and trying to be somebody I wasn't. And uh, I had to change. Um, I had to find a different source of peace. I had to find my church. I had to find sanctuary. And fly fishing in the outdoors was that sanctuary for me. Um, I, I got a connection to the water. I got a connection to the fish and hearing the birds. And I realized that I had a ceremonial practice that involved me getting connected to this, this garden that we have. Going, getting out of my truck and opening my bags, putting my flies out, putting my rod together, smelling the fresh air, hearing the birds, touching the water was all part of my ceremony. And I realized that that is what changed my life. And the one thing I would love to do is get other people to feel that ceremony and to feel that life change that I got from the outdoors. Um, I was invited to come on this journey, and it's a very huge honor for me. Um, and being allowed to film this movie, Totem Bridge, is also huge, and I see this as the way that we can make step forwards to bringing other people along uh, to feel the same way I feel. Um, on this journey so far, I've learned what community and tradition and ceremony mean to many different walks of life. Um, I learned what these fish and what these, what this outdoor life means, what nature means to many different walks of life and how important it is for us to really get all hands on deck and preserve this. Um, to take down these dams and let this water flow, flow free, to bring salmon back to the communities, uh, bring the tradition back, to really unite us back to what we should be doing, uh, which is protecting this beautiful place. Um, I'm glad you guys are all here. This is a beautiful thing. And with these messages you hear and the feelings that you get from this, I hope we can all make the step forward to bringing this, uh, bringing this message full circle and bringing these salmon back home. Thank you, guys. I'm Robin Everett. I am with the Sierra Club. Um, and I'm often asked throughout my career, why do I do this work? Why am I an activist? And it's really hard to put a finger on it. Um, I don't know, it's just something inside me. I get hard to, hard to really articulate why. Um, it's more than just my head, and it's more than the science. It's sacred. It comes from a profound sense of connection to this earth and its inhabitants. I have had the honor to get to work with members of the Lummi tribe for many years, um, starting with uh, the fight to stop the coal export terminal at Cherry Point, which is the Lummi's ancestral homelands. When I first got to meet folks from Lummi, um, was at a ceremony at Cherry Point where they burned a check, um, a big giant check from SSA Marine who wanted to build this terminal. Um, and it was a ceremony that profoundly impacted me. 
when I was there, I was like, wow, okay, this is different. Um, this is really powerful. This is rooted in thousands of years of ancestry. Um, I was just blown away. And I was given the honor to be able to go on the 2014 Totem Pole Journey to South Dakota, where I got to sit in the home of Face Spotted Eagle and hear the stories of fighting the Keystone XL Pipeline and winning, <laughs> by the way, to hear from the other women that she worked with about their responsibility to teach the next generation of young women the traditional cultural practices and to keep that alive. And I got to experience an incredible journey with Jewel James and Doug James. The years that I got to go on journey after journey with them really profoundly impacted me. It wasn't about climate change necessarily, right? It was about protecting their homeland, protecting their way of life, pushing back against an unrelenting force that just wanted to destroy them. And the, that journey and the journeys after really added so much to my purpose. Yes, I was responsible for the animals on this planet. And yes, I was responsible for future generations. But I was also responsible for the irreparable harm of colonialism of my ancestors, of my organization. And so this journey also is a pushback against the unrelenting capitalism and so-called progress against the indigenous way of life. And the impact of these dams and on our orca and our salmon. As Jay said, the orca are their relatives under the sea. They are salmon people. I may never really understand that, truly. I may never really truly understand that kind of connection. But a piece of that lives inside of me. A piece of that comes somewhere in this universe. And I bet a bunch of you feel that way too. And so why do I do this work? I do this work because I have a sacred responsibility to all of you, to the Lummi people, to every bit of good that is left on this planet. Thank you. Hello. My name is Becca Economopoulos. It's an honor to stand here before you and with the other speakers today. I'm Greek, um, born and raised in the East Coast, and I want to acknowledge um, some of my team members here who've traveled with us, Jason and Andrea and Otong and my daughter Mila. We are with Not an Alternative, which is a collective that is artist-led. Um, our name was derived from a famous quote from Margaret Thatcher. She said, there is no alternative to capitalism. So we were interested in pointing to the option that is not an option. The alternative that is not an alternative. On the theme of today's event, art, ceremony, and activism, I want to start by expressing our understanding of art, which is to make that which is indescri to describe that which is indescribable, to make visible that which is invisible or even actively repressed. In 2014, we started a project called the Natural History Museum, 
which is both a traveling and pop-up museum, and also a project to intervene upon, subvert, and transform museums of science and natural history. When we first started for our first several years, um, our work aimed at pointing to that which was repressed or not visible within museums of science and natural history, including the presence of their top funders and board members who spend tens of millions of dollars to deny climate science and support the extraction of life, labor, and land. But many years into this, and to working with the Lummi, we shifted our focus from museums to natural history more broadly, the ever unfolding history of life and land. And we, came very, we became very interested in the perspective that colonization imposed on the landscape, that the colonizers moving westward attempted to create a new indigeneity to replace and displace the old. And their work was organized around what they saw to be an obstacle or threat to their efforts to kill the collective responsibility to the land and each other. And instead, through guns, germs, and steel, but also through measuring sticks and surveyor's tools, they overlaid a grid atop the landscape, enclosing it as property to own and control. This is the era of kill the Indian to save the man. They understood they were not just dealing with an Indian child, but an entire culture inside the child. And to kill the child or to, sa to save the child meant to turn it into an individual in competition with others. To kill the Indian meant to get rid of the collective uh, responsibility to the land and each other, past, present, and future. So for the past six years, we've been traveling with the Lummi and observing and experiencing ceremony around the totem poles. And at each stop, we witnessed what we understood to be an invitation to those present to lay hands on the pole, to be a part of its ceremony. And it wasn't just an invitation to those present who became a part of the pole it was those who came before who had been a part of the poll, and those who are yet to come. At the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, where we brought an exhibition about the totem pole journeys, Chief Namuks from the Wet'suwet'en First Nation peoples laid hands on the pole and told everyone gathering there, this is not art, it's a story. It's history, and you are becoming a part of that. And so it is an opening, not something that is closed off or enclosed like property. The pole is not reducible to its material characteristics as a western red cedar with X feet of girth. With the Lummi, we see within the pole a cultural relation. And it is not reducible to art that can be commodified and sold on the market. Outside is the Orca Totem Pole in an exhibition and screening that you can see tonight and tomorrow night. It was originally designed to be shown at the Florida Museum of Natural History. And the Lummi wanted it to be about the orcas. We were based in Brooklyn, New York. We don't know anything about the Lummi relationship to Quelchomishten, the people who live under the sea. 
We flew out and we asked for instructions. At the last exhibition about the totem pole journeys, it was very information heavy. We had photographs from all of the journeys told you about what happened. But for this one, our instruction was enchant the sea. That actually gave us a lot to go with. The orca is not reducible to its biological characteristics. Like the cedar, within it, we find a cultural relation. And within that, we understand two distinct and fundamentally irreconcilable ways of seeing, understanding, and relating to the world we share in common. So I want to close with a video that I think illustrates that quite well with the voice of Freddie Lane of Lemmy Nation. The total pole journey doesn't draw a new line as much as it traces over one that already exists, making it visible. This line runs through the rocks, through the trees, through the sky, through the ocean. The burial grounds of the ancestors Thank you. Arts, ceremony, and activism. Now, that's a uh, that's a lot to try to say in one little short uh, gathering like this. But uh, I'm, for, I'm fortunate because I have a brother, uh, Kurt Russo, and we worked together for 44 years. And we've done a lot of 
activism. And we did a lot of uh, things according to academia as well. Dr. Russo uh, created the Falcon Research Center uh, way back in the late 70s. Uh, he, uh, and, uh, he had a, na a national board and an international board. And, uh, studied a lot of values in conflict. And that intrigued me. And I was really interested because my uh, background at the time as I took over the Lummi Fisheries Program back in 1979 as the youngest uh, director of the program, I, w I had to cut because Reaganomics hit and we had to cut everybody that was not necessary. And I liked what he was doing because I had a political science degree and a psychology degree. And I thought this is going to uh, become valuable in our battle over the protection of rivers, water, uh, 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 salmon, and the forest. And so we, we committed to work together ever since. But before that, uh, back when I was a young teenager, my mother brought uh, several of us down to uh, our first protest at Daybreak Star Center. And uh, they were handing out signs. And I was just kind of being lazy. And I kind of got a little slower than everybody else. So pretty soon, uh, uh, it looked like I was leading the damn protest. And all the cameras come running over, and they start taking photos, and they're video recording me. And uh, I wasn't doing anything different or phenomenal. I wasn't acting, I wasn't raising my hand and screaming. I just had a sign. And finally, I stopped to look at the sign that they're photographing. It said, white man killed our women and raped our buffalo. And uh, I realized what you do in these uh, protests kind of matter, you know, and uh, there's ways to get a, a, a message out. And so that kind of was my first uh, experience on protest. But, you know, we blocked uh, logging roads and stopped the logs from coming out. We blocked ferries and stopped the ferries from operating. We, we blocked stores from selling liquor to our people. Uh, we stopped a major clear cut of an ancient old growth forest. Uh, we, we were fighting uh, major corporations. They're going to do clear cuts, and uh, nobody thought we could stop them. Uh, a JIPO outfit out of China said there's no way we could stop them. They offered to Lummi Nation 30,000 acres of clear cut forest, and we would get out of the way uh, and let them clear cut the uh, old growth forest that they had targeted. Uh, in the end, uh, we defeated them, working with the churches and corporations, and uh, uh, Kurt was able to raise several million dollars and buy them off, and that was so encouraging to uh, Paul Dolan and ABC Disney now, who didn't realize that a private person could raise funds and buy a force, so he raised $80 million uh, and bought Sterling Forest outside of New York in order to protect the water supply of uh, the city of New York. Over the years, we fought, fought to protect traditional cemeteries where our ancestors were being dug up. Uh, one we bought back, it's uh, Madrona Point. Others were just had to go in and recover the ancestors. Uh, when they're after the university, had them all stored. And I, I have to thank Jay's great grandparents because they're two of the four elders that taught me on the process of uh, ancestor recovery. Uh, I was on the tribal council, and I served as vice chairman and treasurer and as a general member, and uh, I was on 28 committees, boards, and commissions, and I was trying to do two jobs and try to be a fisherman along with my brothers that were actively engaged in fishing rights. But over the years, we had to uh, re uh, protect a lot of treaty fishing rights. I was in law school. The tribe called me back. The IRS was defeating the Indian nations on uh, attempting to tax treaty resources, and they asked me to coordinate a national campaign, and I said I could only do it if I have Dr. Russo with me, uh, my uh, buddy here, because he has a lot of ways of uh, planning and strategizing and coordinating. But we waged a campaign nationwide, and we stopped the uh, IRS in their tracks, and we did that not once, but twice, but not twice, but three times we've been involved in those type of campaigns, and activism is a strange word. I, I was able to lobby the United States House of Representatives. I lobbied the Senate over and over. I lobbied the Reagan uh, White House, the Clinton White House, the uh, big uh, George Bush White House, not the little Bush, just the big Bush, but, uh, and the Obama. You know, and uh, we did work in uh, Australia, we did work in Chile, we did work in Mexico and Guatemala and South Africa, and uh, I know when we're down there battling and helping or, uh, work with the natives in Chile, 
Uh, I was talking to uh, my colleague and uh, our interpreter, who's a Lummi tribal member, Shinoi Gawa. She speaks Spanish, and so she was there to interpret with us. And uh, while, I, while I got kidnapped by basically the aim of Chile to go up and broadcast for them, uh, Kurt and Shinoi ended up pushed in front of a major protest. Next thing you know, they're up on the national capital steps there making a <laughs> protest <laughs> statements against Pinochet. Now I was in the audience, but I think, oh my God, going to get us killed. You know, and, uh, in, in comes the uh, Pinochet militia uh, with Uzis and battle gear ready to break everybody up. But, you know, Kirk imported an activist named Johnny White Cloud, the late Johnny White Cloud, and he's gone now, but he was a peyote road man, and uh, he prayed for justice. The next time Pinochet left country, and, uh, Spain held him until the day he died. And so I always say, thank you, Johnny. You know, uh, it took everybody. But I, I give Johnny a lot of credit because I believe in the way of peyote. Um, I, I'm a peyote person, and I'm a, a traditional spirit person. My brother runs Sweat Lodge, and so we do Sweat Lodge. And my brother's a, a, not only a Christian, but a Shaker a member, him and his mate. And so we try to practice the way of spirituality to give us the strength we need in order to do the things that we have to do. It doesn't come easy, and you have to have commitment. Uh, you know, like uh, being active enough to go in and challenge the Department of Interior and Department of State so that they give you, they give you the assignment to write the paper that's going to go to the president and he's going to accept the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Why is that important? Because it's basically saying that we have rights as indigenous nations and the United States has an obligation to sit down with us as equals. Uh, sovereign governments, uh, and that we will agree as to how we're going to do our recovery. But they have to do everything, including all the member individual states of the United States, have to commit to the national policy that we have the right to speak out. We have the right to protect what's important to us. You know, many, a few times I've been at our national gatherings where I see the tribal leaders at about 12, 1,500 of them out there, and the uh, federal government's up there making a statement, and they're saying things that I, I find uh, insulting. And why would I be insulted by it? Because I know, I know that those tribal leaders are sent there to represent their people. And I would get up and I'd say, don't forget who you represent. There are women, children, and elders dying at home. Do they know you're sitting here with your mouth closed? You're not saying anything. Don't accept this. Don't let them treat you like that. Because they're talking down to our sovereignty. Talking down to us. You know, and, um, I was in Washington, D.C. There are 300 national leaders from Indian country gathering on the question of sovereignty. And 9-11 hit. And Washington, D.C. looked like uh, it was an occupied country. You know, there were armed forces all over the place. Every intersection was getting blocked down. The troops were there. You know, and the uh, Pentagon got hit. The towers got hit. Flight 93 crashed. And it took us a long time to get out of Washington, D.C. And up until that time, I was working with uh, Dr. Russo here, and uh, when I was uh, uh, first going to college, I committed to studying Northwest Indian art to work with our late brother, Dale. Uh, I always tell people, say, how'd you get into the art? And I said, well, my little brother was being trained at the museum by a, mas a Lummi uh, master carver. And I remember I stopped by the house before I went off to college, and he came running out and he showed me his first carving. And he was so proud of it. His eyes were twinkling. He had a smile. And I looked at it and I thought, my God, that's the ugliest thing I ever saw. You know, and, uh, but that's my little brother. I can't say that to him. I said, you know, it's a hippie era. God, that's cool, bro. You know, he was so happy with that. Ran in and carved even harder. But I said, I'm going to study the art. And I'll be there. And by the time I retire age, I'll be able to really uh, be involved in uh, art as a master. That was my goal. But when we came home from Washington, D.C., I was talking to Kurt because uh, he goes, hey, because we've been carving. We formed the House of Tears Carvers for the late uh, brother and uh, others that have died, uh, members of the House of Tears Carvers that originally created it are gone now from various illnesses. And so I decided that we're going to keep that alive. And uh, 
So we got back from uh, Washington, D.C., and after that time, Kurt says, you know, we fought for uh, uh, sacred places in Southern California. He did, and uh, he worked with Paul Dolan over in New York on Sterling Forest, and then we worked, and we just got bought, bought out uh, Arlingle Creek, and he goes, we're going to pay you for a totem pole. Hey, that sounded pretty good to me. You know, finally, gonna get, somebody's going to buy something from me, you know, so, um, so uh, but we got back, as you know, Kurt, uh, I know you want to pay for that, Paul, but we, what about those children? What about those children who lost all those parents in the Twin Towers on Flight 93, Flight 77? We've got to do something. We've got to let them know that we know what grief is. We know what it means to suffer as Indian people. We've got to be out there and let them know you can recover. We're here for you. And so we did the uh, first 9-11 totem pole journey. And as my brother witnessed, bear witness to, people were coming from states, coming up two or three states away just to intercept the totem pole, just to put their prayers there, just to send their prayers back there to the families. Some of them had families that were in the Twin Towers. That's why they drove so far. It was a way for them to relieve their grief. One of the, there's always special moments when you're doing this type of activism and you're paying attention. We come out, there's a little African-American boy. And he's, he's about four, four and a half. All by himself, kneeling down with his hands on the pole and praying. Just praying really hard. All by himself, nobody else around. That was the greatest, that was a moment I would never forget. Then we're over in uh, 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 Sterling Forest and we're raising that pole over there. And uh, this young boy, he's about nine, he gets up, he goes, my dad is a New York fireman. I'm proud of my dad. He went in three times to save people. But he didn't make it out. I'll never forget my dad. Man, just had me cry and I hugged my little baby boy. Things are worth it when you really touch people, when you're really able to pull them out. You know, whether they're coming from grief or because they're concerned. And we learned on uh, 9-11 that there was a lot of tragedy. Uh, Abraham, he was a retired uh, uh, Department of Defense uh, during those days. And he was happily married for 25 years. And he made a, a dinner with champagne and flowers and candles, waiting for his wife to come home for the Pentagon. And she was dead center on where Flight 77 hit. They could only identify her by um, uh, DNA. But he flew all the way out from D.C. and he carved on that Pentagon totem pole. 20,000 pounds of totem pole. Uh, two 13-foot uprights and a 38-foot uh, cross piece. Now in Congressional Cemetery. We put uh, totem poles up uh, as ways of gathering communities. We put them in an old soldiers' home. We put them at uh, cancer centers. We put them at public schools. We put them in Indian boarding schools. We got them at universities. It's all about pole, and, and this is in addition to the totem pole journeys that we have done over the past 20 years that have become national. Well, Salewa Tooth Nation up in British Columbia got a hold of Kirk. Uh, they had a message. They say we can't seem to get people to hear us. We're concerned about the tar sands and the pipeline coming down right through our territory. It's going to destroy the Fraser River. Well, let's do a totem pole journey. So we carved a totem pole and went to the Sioux Nation and had them pray on it first and did reverse campaign. And by the time we got back to Salewa Tooth Nation, they had 7.8 million hits on their website. And so it was helping them. We learned that it helps. We put totem poles as an active way to try to help support the uh, Beaver Lake Free up in northern Alberta. You know, they, it, that tar sands looked like the moon. It's stripped. It's poisoned. The water, the air is poisoned. The fish, the, the, the animals, the people are dying of cancer. And we're down here reaping the benefits of the oil being produced. You know, so everything that we enjoy down here costs somebody. Some part of the earth is dying. Some part of the earth is being raped, stripped, and destroyed. Somebody's suffering for our easy way of life. 
And so we're happy to be able to go up there. And they were concerned. They're not traditional people. Weren't being heard. And after the journey, they turned back to traditional belief and uh, supported the people. Same thing with uh, Northern Cheyenne. When they went back to traditional, while well, they told the uh, uh, largest proposed clear cut, I mean, a uh, strip mine company, we're going to oppose you. So they packed their suitcases and left. You know, so these, these campaigns are successful because church groups, environmental groups, universities, tribes, citizens groups, they come out. It's a way of uh, gathering the people. They'll come out and see what you've got. You know, so we're not there raising our hand, uh, burning boats. Yeah, we burn boats. Yeah, we burn symbolic texts. We do those other campaigns, too. Whatever it takes to get the voice heard. But art as a medium for calling the people out. They'll, they want to come out and see what you've got. You know, most people, especially across the country, don't have trees bigger than this wide. You know, so anything bigger than that is a big tree to them. They don't know that we have nine and ten foot wide trees yet. You know, so uh, we've done a lot of campaigns. We've done a lot on the area of indigenous rights, environmental rights, tribal rights, and the call for all of us to join in unity. Join in unity. But these campaigns only work, one, if you get the media out, and two, if you get the citizens, the people that are gathering, to do something. None of this matters if you don't call somebody, if you don't share it, if you don't pass it on, if you don't ask for changes. Call your congressmen. Call the politicians. Let them know that you really believe this has got to happen, that you will go get ten other people, and have them get ten other people, and that you will start making calls to call for them to be out of office if they don't start protecting the world around us. What do you want for your grandchildren? What do you want for your grandchildren? You know, keep that in mind. They're inheriting what you leave behind. And if you don't speak out, they're going to say, yeah, my grandma, she didn't do anything. My grandpa, he didn't do anything. They just sat there while the world died around us. You know, so, am I done? Okay. That's, that's my, uh, I'm going to keep on going anyway, so I'm just going to go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you so much to all of you, to all our speakers. If you want to take action and do something, go to Spirit of the Waters, Spirit of the Waters, one word, dot org, right? Um, just to follow up on Joel's uh, call.